Yeah, we're going to start then. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We have a small but beautiful turnout today. It's definitely symptomatic of the end of term. Um, and it, it, it's a very special seminar for me because I personally invited Rob Tell. I really wanted to hear her talk. I'd heard her speak uh, online anyway, not in real life. And I thought I really wanted to hear about this book in person. Um, Dr. Rob Tell Niaji Paley is Assistant Professor International Social and Public Policy at LSE. But more importantly than that, she's a SOAS alumnus. Very pleased to have you. Um, and she joined the LSE Department of Social Policy in September 2022, teaches, as, as she was just telling me, development studies to social policy scholars, so they will at least know something about development. Um, she's a Liberian scholar activist working at the intersection of critical development studies, critical African studies, and critical race studies. That's a lot of critical. Uh, she centers her research on how structural transformation is conceived and contested. Her current book project is Africa's Negro Republics, examines how slavery, colonialism, and neoliberalism in the 19th, 20th, and 20th centuries, respectively, have shaped the adoption and maintenance of clauses barring non-blacks from obtaining citizenship in Liberia and Sierra Leone. She's conduct conducted research in four continents um, and has authored this book, Development, Dual Citizenship and Its Discontents in Africa, The Political Economy of Belonging to Liberia, and it's won multiple prizes, the 2022 African Politics Conference Group Best Book Award, and the 2023 African Studies Association of Africa Pius Adesanmi Memorial Award for Excellence in African Writing, and, and also contributed to the passage of the dual citizenship law in Liberia. She's published a lot of articles, and she uh, has been a Leverhulm Early Career Fellow at Oxford, an Ibrahim Leadership Fellow at the African Development Bank Group, and has a, has a penchant for working with presidents, which we'll probably hear some more about, I think, soon. So very pleased to have you here, Rob Tell. We'd like to hear from you now. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to try that again. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> That's better. Uh, Naomi, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Um, and as Naomi mentioned, I am an alum of SOAS, of the Development Studies Department at SOAS. So it's a double honor to be back um, on home turf. I do miss SOAS tremendously, but I know you're just a stone's throw away from the LSE. Uh, and the book that I'm going to present is actually based on my PhD thesis that was written here. And I often tell people that I effectively came into my own as a critical development studies scholar activist right here on this campus. Um, this department molded me into the person who's very curious about what are the intersections between development, socioeconomic transformation, structural transformation, and ideas about citizenship writ large not only in the context of Liberia, but also across the continent and the, the world, as it were. So that is what I'm gonna be presenting today. And for the purposes of this presentation, which doesn't seem to want to move. Let's see. Okay. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, I have outlined the presentation in three parts. So part one essentially focuses on my main arguments Part two focuses on what contributions I think I'm making, not only theoretically, but also methodologically and empirically. And then part three focuses on implications of the work for policymaking and practice. And before I delve into the actual presentation, I want to read an excerpt of the book because I think it will give you a sense of the texture of the kinds of things that I'm doing. In many respects, I think of myself as a scholar but also a storyteller. And I think effectively that's what academics are, even though sometimes we don't think of ourselves as storytellers. So I infuse this book with um, vignettes. I infuse this book with block quotes from my interlocutors, who you will hear about a little bit later in the presentation. I infuse this book with lived realities of the people that I encounter um, and my own experiences of collecting this data. So. This excerpt is from chapter one um, of the monograph and it's entitled Methodological, Theoretical, and Biographical Reflections. In mid-May 2013, at the Buruburam refugee camp on the outskirts of Accra, Ghana's capital, 
a petite seamstress hurtled out of a one-room house to fetch rainwater pouring endlessly from her corrugated rooftop. I paused my audio recorder nearly four times during an interview with this 38-year-old former refugee who had opted in 2012 for local integration in Ghana after living there for 23 years. Torrential showers splashed through her punctured window screens, exposing us to the elements. Dripping wet, the woman re-entered the house holding a bright blue bucket on the crown of her head filled with what I assumed was water for washing clothes and bathing and placed it in a corner of the room. She sat down on a small wooden bench facing me and we continued the interview, shouting to hear each other above the loud clamor of rain. Just one month earlier, I had sat comfortably in the refurbished rooftop office of a 48-year-old 40 Liberian businessman and consultant in downtown Freetown, Sierra Leone's capital. Exuding confidence and privilege, the man had lived and worked in similar settings across five different countries within sub-Saharan Africa for two decades. When he offered me a chilled orange Fanta in a sleek hourglass bottle, I could not help noticing his form-fitting tailor-made suit as the man walked to the single leather recliner facing me, his shiny shoes made a soft noise on the white porcelain tiles. I placed my recorder on his mahogany table and pressed play. So I'll end here because I think um, what this excerpt effectively is emblematic of is this book is very much about contrasts. It's very much about continuities and discontinuities of being Liberian and practicing Liberian citizenship from both domestically but also diasporic or transnationally. It's a book about contrast between what I call the powerful and seemingly powerless. It's a book about contrast between the prosperous and the poor, as you can see from the refugee woman and the businessman in Sierra Leone. It's a book about the diasporic and the domestic. It's a book about the contrast between citizen and what we might deem non-citizen, young and old men and women. It's a book about contrast. And I started writing this book again when I was at SOAS, but the kernel of the book was really planted, Naomi mentioned or alluded to the fact that I work or have worked for presidents, both the president of the African Development Bank as well as the president of Liberia. And when I worked for the president of Liberia in this really dynamic post-war moment between 2007 and 2011, one of the things I was tasked with, having written a master's dissertation on the political, economic, and social implications of Liberians moving back during the post-war period of Liberia, this really dynamic process. And President Sirleaf said, okay, great, you've written this master's dissertation, now you come up with a diaspora engagement strategy for the government of Liberia. Now that's a huge task for someone who's in their mid-20s, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, incredibly idealistic. But I took on this responsibility quite seriously because as someone who was diasporic and transnational in my own right, I wanted to find out <clears throat> how could we harness the political, economic, and social potential of Liberians living abroad to contribute to post-war reconstruction. So I started doing a lot of interviews. I interviewed Liberians in Australia. I interviewed Liberians in parts of Europe, in parts of North America, in parts of West Africa, the sub-region. And one thing that I kept hearing over and over again is, why is the government now petitioning us to become engaged in post-war reconstruction when the government and the state has effectively told us that we are not citizens if we naturalize elsewhere. At the time, when I was doing these interviews in 2010, 2011, Liberia was one of a few countries in the West African subregion, as well as across the continent of Africa, that prohibited dual citizenship. And given its migratory history, it seems actually counterintuitive. So the seed of this book was actually planted when I worked for the government of Liberia, and I was able to develop a PhD thesis proposal based on that. And thanks to Laura Hammond and um, a number of other development studies scholars and uh, faculty member, members in the de um, Department of Development Studies, the thesis eventually became a book after I did graduate from SOAS. So that's effectively what this book is about. It's about asking questions, as my interlocutors did at the time, what does it mean to be a citizen in a post-war context when the state has effectively told those citizens, those who live abroad, who may have naturalized, that they are no longer a part of the nation state um, formally through the sort of citizenship architecture that you set up. So without much ado, I'll move into my major arguments. 
And, um, and I think one of the things I want to do, because I know not everybody in the room is familiar with Liberia and its historical trajectory, but I would say that one of the things that I find particularly fascinating and important in terms of my contributions is the fact is the case study of Liberia is quite unique, right? Liberia is Africa's first black republic. And as a result, it was really the first country in the continent of Africa to devise legal norms around membership, around citizenship, around belonging. And it's, this book is also the first study that investigates not only domestic, but also diasporic constructions of citizenship across space and time. So I take a very historical kind of um, look at citizenship and how it's changed, configured and reconfigured across space and time. And then also the myriad implications of development, right? So what are the implications of this configuration and reconfiguration across space and time on processes of socioeconomic transformation, structural transformation? And when I talk about development in this book, I'm not talking about the sort of single-minded pursuit of economic growth. I'm not talking about the privileging of Western whiteness and modernity, as is the case in mainstream development discourses. What I'm really talking about in this book is asking questions about how people's experiences of poverty, progress, privilege, are mediated across time and space to affect some sort of um, change, right? And that change can be technological, it can be political, it can be economic, and it can be social, so forth and so on. And so I do this by using a bill that was introduced in the Liberian legislature in 2008. At the time, I was actually living and working in Liberia, right? A bill that was introduced in Liberia in 2008 that, interestingly enough, was suspended. It lingered in legislative limbo for about eight or about 10 years, from 2008 until about 2018. And I'm investigating this book or this bill, using it as an entry point to ask broader questions about what does it mean to be a citizen or a non-citizen in a post-war context. So before I go into the major arguments, I do want to say as a preface that the dual citizenship law in Liberia, there was a dual citizenship law that was passed after the book was published. So the book was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, and a dual citizenship law was passed in Liberia in 2022. So imagine between 2008 and the bill, when the bill was introduced until 2022, you have a long kind of trajectory of suspension and contestations therein <laughs> about what are the kind of merits or demerits of dual citizenship as it relates to Liberia, which is a migratory country. So what are my major arguments? The first is that mid while mid-19th century Liberian citizenship, mid-19th century to about mid-20th century Liberian citizenship was largely passive and constructed from above by a hegemonic state. Mid-20th century onwards Liberian citizenship has been largely active and reconstructed from below by citizens themselves. And this has usually been through processes of protest, right? Now, why is this? In the book, I take three historical and contemporary factors that I believe have been fundamentally important in terms of this introduction of the bill, but also the suspension of the bill. And I argue that these three processes of conflict migration and post-war recovery, and then I have a separate chapter on globalization, have effectively configured and reconfigured Liberian citizenship across space and time and produced, as a result, this contestation around dual citizenship. So for the purposes of this presentation, I wanna focus on the example of migration. So there's a whole chapter on migration. And what's interesting about Liberia is when Liberia was established as Africa's first black republic, it was, in 1847, it was a country of relative immigration, IMMI. Right? It was a country where you had large waves of black migrant settlers who were coming from places such as the Congo River Basin, who were coming from places like the United States, who were coming from places like the Caribbean. And they were effectively fleeing, these were free black people, they were fleeing um, racial discrimination in these places, particularly the Caribbean and uh, the United States. Right. So Liberia is established in 1847, it's a country of relative immigration, large waves of people moving into the country. However, at the time, Liberia was a country whose laws, whose citizenship laws and regulations were biased against what I call the rooted indigen, right? The rooted indigen, a country of relative immigration, but its laws and regulations around citizenship biased against the rooted indigen. And what do I mean by the rooted indigen? So as is the case of human history, whenever a country is founded, and I put this in huge quotation marks, 
there usually are people already in that particular settlement, and Liberia is no different. So when these black migrant settlers came from the Congo River Basin and the Caribbean and the United States, they met people in this territory that would eventually become Liberia. Now, many of these people lived in the hinterland, so further north. They didn't necessarily settle on the coast, but there were coastal indigenous populations who encountered these black migrant settlers. And for the first 100 years of the Republic's existence, citizenship was barred. These indigenous populations were barred from obtaining citizenship. A country of relative immigration, but biased against the rooted indigen. Now, in the 20th century, mid-20th century onwards, Liberia is considered a country of relative emigration, especially during processes of movement during the armed conflict and any sort of political upheaval from 1980 onwards. So Liberia is considered a country of relative emigration, EMI, right? However, its citizenship laws and norms, before this dual citizenship law was passed in 2022, its citizenship laws and norms were biased against what I call the rootless emigrant, Right? So effectively, Liberians who left during political upheaval, left during the armed conflict of 1989 to 2003, and naturalized elsewhere were barred from maintaining their Liberian citizenship because the country did not recognize dual citizenship. Not only that, descendants or children of these Liberians who moved to other locales outside of the country, who either um, obtained citizenship by birth through another country, they were barred from dual citizenship as well. So a country of relative emigration from the 1980s onwards, and it still has norms, legal norms around citizenship and membership that are biased against the rootless emigrant. Now this isn't surprising because a lot of scholars such as Bronwyn Manby, a colleague of mine at the LSE, as well as Mahmoud Mamdani, whose work you might be more familiar with, um, the seminal text, Citizen and Subject, have argued that citizenship is viscerally contested in countries that have experienced colonial era migration, right? Now, although Liberia wasn't formally colonized by European powers, it's one of two countries in the continent that was not formally colonized by European powers, it did experience heightened levels of colonial era migration of these black migrant settlers who were coming from these different places outside of the West African subregion. So that's my first argument. The second argument that I make is that this sort of 21st century impasse or gridlock on dual citizenship, where you have so much contestation around the merits or demerits of dual citizenship, is effectively emblematic of these enduring struggles over citizenship in Liberia across space and time. Now, before Liberia passed its dual citizenship bill in July 2022, it was one of only seven countries in the continent that are effectively, were effectively outliers, right, that prohibited dual citizenship. And the other six were Cameroon, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, right? So this 21st century contestation, gridlock on dual citizenship, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's a sort of historical trajectory of contestations around citizenship from that very moment of Liberia's establishment as Africa's first black republic. The third argument that I make is, and this is where we bring the ideas of development into the fore, is that domestic Liberians as well as diasporic Liberians effectively have very, very different understandings or conceptualizations of citizenship, dual citizenship, and their interactions with development, right? So what I discovered is that these domestic and diasporic Liberians interpret dual citizenship differently based on what the development sociologist Norman Long calls their life worlds, their lived experiences, and also their social location, so their socioeconomic status. Um, what I discovered when I was doing my interviews with 200 plus Liberians across five different cities, five different countries, three different continents, which I'll talk a little bit about when I'm speaking about my methodological approach, is that domestic Liberians effectively saw dual citizenship as a zero-sum game, as effectively infringing upon their already very limited access to political, economic, and social rights, as privileging a seemingly privileged class of already privileged people, i.e. transnational Liberians. Whether that rhetoric met the reality is a different matter altogether, right? However, on the other hand, the diasporic Liberians I spoke to, the transnational Liberians that I spoke to saw dual citizenship as a development enabler, whereas the, many of the domestic Liberians that I spoke to were very fearful and had anxieties around the prospects of legislating dual citizenship. Those I spoke to abroad argue that dual citizenship would entrench 
the political, economic, and social contributions that Liberians abroad are already making to socioeconomic transformation, that are already making to post-war recovery, right? So you see that sort of dichotomy between the diasporic mystique around dual citizenship and the, dias and the domestic kind of anxieties around dual citizenship. So there's a quote, two quotes that I've pulled up from my interviews and the book, which I think are very emblematic of this idea of the di dichotomy. So it reveals the diasporic aspirations for dual citizenship, but also the domestic anxieties. And if you read the book, a lot of people pick up on the fact that I'm very, very much interested in alliteration. I told you that I'm a storyteller and as much as I am a scholar. Um, so diasporic aspirations versus domestic anxieties. So you see the alliteration there. The first quote is from Cletus Watterson. He was a senator at the time and also the sponsor of the dual citizenship bill when the interviews were conducted between 2012 and 2013. And he says, and I quote, a lot of them, meaning a Liberians abroad, had to change their lifestyle, accept the dictates from a strange country for survival. In some countries, it meant you had to become a citizen of that country to enjoy the benefits. But in taking that involuntary stance, it qualified them for disqualification of their citizenships in their own country, i.e. Liberia, which I believe is unfair. So for me, that quote is incredibly emblematic of the diasporic aspirations of what dual citizenship can do and the justification for legislating dual citizenship. The other quote is from Jewel Howard Taylor, who was a, a co-sponsor of the bill. She was a senator at the time. She eventually became vice president in 2018. And for me, her quote is effectively emblematic of the domestic anxieties, even though she could recognize the domestic anxieties, even though she was a co-sponsor of the bill. And she says, you know, Liberians here, meaning in the country Liberia, a lot of them are not working. They're unemployed, and they feel as if Liberians coming from the diaspora, who have, all of these, who have had all of these opportunities, want to come and take their space, right? Domestic anxieties. And I would even push this quote further and say, it, just, it wasn't just the Liberians who were unemployed who were contesting the legislating of dual citizenship. It wasn't just Liberians who were poor. It was also prosperous Liberians who were doing relatively well and already privileged in their own right, who were very, very much anxious about the prospects of legislating dual citizenship, right? And these are what I call homelanders, and I'll talk about that term a little bit later. So you see the dichotomy already kind of play out in these two quotes, and they certainly played out in my interviews with Liberians across, um, across these different sites that I will discuss a bit later. So what does the book do in addition to uh, revealing these, um, these sort of dichotomies, right? these discontinuities? It provides a critical framing of development, as I mentioned already. For me, development is more than just this sort of single-minded pursuit of economic growth. It's more than just privileging Western whiteness and modernity. Um, and it frames, dual, it frames development as a process of both amelioration, betterment, movement, progress moving forward, but also a process of degeneration. So for those domestic Liberians who view dual citizenship as a development disenabler, they would see the introduction of dual citizenship as a development policy or policy prescription as degeneration, not as amelioration, right? And more importantly, I frame citizenship as a continuum of both inclusion as well as exclusion. In many respects, citizenship, as is the case in the academic literature, but also the policy literature, is multi-layered, right? It's differentiated along so many different social qualifiers, such as race, such as class, such as gender, such as ethnicity, such as ability, such as sexual orientation, so forth and so on. And even though people might experience or have formal legal citizenship, their experience of that citizenship will differ based on these different social qualifiers. So I'll give you an example in the context of Liberia, how Liberian citizenship is multi-layered. How is it differentiated? The, the case study that I want to give is the case study of race. So you may or may not be familiar with the fact that Liberia is one of two countries in the continent of Africa that has race-based citizenship clauses. Now, this is the subject of my second book, so I won't belabor the issue. Um, I'm writing a book at the moment called Africa's Negro Republics, and it talks about this race-based citizenship clause. So Liberia is one of those countries, and then Sierra Leone is one of those countries. So this race-based clause effectively states that only people of Negro descent are entitled to Liberian citizenship. Now, you might be actually quite appalled by that and say, well, that's a racist clause. But you have to understand the history of Liberia. 
right? Liberia, again, was founded by black settlers, free men and women who came from these different places. And what they were trying to do by inserting this clause in the Constitution, and then it eventually made its way into the 1973 Aliens and Nationality Law, is to ensure that only people of Negro descent would be able to control the means of production, i.e. land, given the experiences in the United States and the Caribbean, so forth and so on, right? And so they instituted or inserted this Negro clause in the Constitution, particularly for economic reasons, right? For protection, for protectionist reasons. And one of the questions I'm asking is, in this day and age in the 21st century, what kind of purpose does this protectionist clause serve, given that you have large populations of South Asian nationals who've lived in Liberia, who've lived in Sierra Leone for long periods of time, and have effectively settled there? So what are the socioeconomic implications of barring these non-black populations from obtaining citizenship um, in the 21st century? That's one of the questions that I'm asking. Is this clause considered racist? Is it protectionist? Is it neither? Is it both? To what extent does it assert black personhood? To what extent does it challenge white supremacy in the 21st century? Those are the questions that I'm asking. And then looking at the sort of historical trajectory. So Liberia is definitely, definitely fundamentally differentiated along um, the social qualifier of race. It's also differentiated along other social qualifiers, but I won't have very much time to talk about those. The other thing I do in the book is I interrogate this sort of presumed um, assumption that there is a symbiotic relationship between development and dual citizenship. So a lot of policymakers will argue, and a lot of policymakers have argued, that if you institute dual citizenship, economic development or socioeconomic transformation will triple right, it'll quadruple, it'll increase exponentially. So I interrogate this presumed kind of symbiotic relationship by demonstrating that in Liberia, in the Liberian context, as is the case in other contexts that had contestations around dual citizenship in the sub-region, dual citizenship is actually viscerally contested as not only a development intervention, but a policy prescription that has development um, implications or that has development um, dividends. The other thing that I do is I present critiques of dual citizenship. So again, this idea of dual citizenship being a given, a public good. A lot of scholars have argued that dual citizenship effectively is about extending rights without necessarily extracting responsibilities. And I saw this manifest itself in a lot of the interviews where people talked a lot about the rights part of the equation, but not sufficiently enough about the responsibilities part of the equation, right? So extending rights without necessarily extracting responsibility. So that citizenship becomes a la carte, right? You choose it at will. Um, it provides certain privileges, but you don't necessarily have obligations that you have to fulfill. Other scholars like um, Whitaker have argued that there actually is no direct correlation between establishing or legislating dual citizenship and increased kind of economic contributions of transnational actors. There hasn't been sufficient evidence to prove that this correlation exists, right? And then the third thing that I do is I'm very intentional, very, very intentional about centering domestic citizenship practice as effectively very, very key to socioeconomic transformation. Quite often the migration literature or the diaspora literature tends to center the citizenship claims of immigrants or transnational actors. And I say, no, domestic citizenship claims are equally as important as diasporic um, citizenship claims. And the reason I do this is because I'm effectively challenging the literature that, again, privileges the citizenship claims of immigrants solely, while paradoxically thinking about how do we change our conceptualizations of citizenship within the context of post-war immigration states like Liberia. Another thing that I do is I attempt in this book to offer a post-colonial critique of the neoliberal framing of diasporas and donors as the panacea, you know, as a solution to post-war reconstruction. In the book, what I demonstrate through my empirical analysis and data um, uh, analysis is that diaspora citizenship claims, their development claims are incredibly, incredibly contested, just as donors development claims are contested. I demonstrate that diasporas are both development enablers, but they are also development spoilers, and that diasporas might be a silver lining, especially in the context of post-war reconstruction or post-war um, change or development. Uh, they're not a silver bullet. Like, again, they're not the panacea to these processes of post-war 
um, economic transformation or post-war political transformation. So I do this throughout the book, but particularly in a chapter that I've titled, it's the last empirical chapter of the book, and it's titled The Dichotomy of Diasporic Developmentalism. I told you about that alliteration. It rears its ugly head throughout the book, right? The Dichotomy of Diasporic Developmentalism. And what am I trying to do in this chapter of the book is I'm trying to demonstrate through the empirical analysis and the, and the, and the data that I present that diasporas can both help, but they can also hinder post-war, post-war development. And in the case of Liberia, there were a number of Liberian um, transnational actors who moved back, myself included, they called us importees, right, who moved back during the post-war moment to work in the public sector. Many of them worked in other sectors, in the private sector, in the humanitarian sector, but a large population of Liberians came back at the invitation of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who in many respects is diasporic in her own right, right? So she invited a lot of these um, technocrats, a lot of these people who'd worked in different sectors um, internationally to come and work in the public sector. And what we found is that you had increased levels of public sector productivity because of the contributions of these Liberians who came back. There's an example that I often give of the first Minister of Finance, Antoinette Saye, who's now the deputy manager, I think, of the IMF. And she was able to secure Liberia's $4.1 billion debt relief, right, through the highly indebted poor countries initiative. Now, some people will argue that that's a very neoliberal initiative, but the fact of the matter is, Liberia was highly indebted after the war because of arrears that had been accrued through interests. Um, from commercial lenders, but also from international financial institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank. And this woman comes in and she's able within a two-year period to get this debt completely erased, right? Both from commercial creditors as well as from the IFIs. So you have large levels of public sector productivity. On one hand, right, diasporas help in terms of post-war reconstruction, but you also have high levels of post-war, corrupt forms of post-war profiteering taking place simultaneously, where a lot of Liberians who were recruited ended up getting their fingers caught in the treasury, right? And they were implicated in large levels of, um, high levels of graft. Many of them were prosecuted, but a lot of them weren't. So what did they do? They just packed up and they left. So you have this sort of dichotomy between the public sector productivity of diasporas moving back returnees moving back, but also simultaneously corrupt forms of post-war profiteering taking place in the same kind of public sector space, right? Diasporas both help and they also hinder post-war development is an argument that I'm making. So in this book, in this chapter, I coin a term called diaspocracy. So if you intend to use this term, please make sure that you cite my book. (laughs) And this term, diaspocracy, is very, very emblematic of not only Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's administration, but you can see diaspocracies rear their, you know, you can see diaspocracy in another context. And diaspocracy is effectively the outsized influence of diasporas or even returnees in managing the affairs of the state, in managing the affairs of government, right? And this was certainly the case where you had more than 50% of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's cabinet recruited from abroad. And so the question that a lot of Liberians in country were asking is, what about our skills? What about our talents? Um, Do we not matter in terms of managing the affairs of the state, right? And it created a lot of tension. It created a lot of um, animosity towards these importees, these returnees, right? So what I argue is that by setting up a system where you have large numbers of diasporas, returnees managing the affairs of the state, it wasn't just about them managing the affairs of the state. It was about them being compensated significantly more than those who were domestically rooted, than those who didn't have significant periods of time abroad, who didn't go to schools like SOAS abroad, right? Who didn't have the sort of international um, prestige or pedigree, right? So what effectively happened is that you had a reproduction of the international system of unequal pay where institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, the UN, pay people according to their passport, you had this taking place and reproduced through the systems of bringing these 
returnees, these diaspora transnational actors back and working in government official, in government, very lucrative positions, not only in terms of the executive, but also in um, state-owned enterprises, what we call cash cows in Liberia, for instance, right? So this reproduction of unequal pay, the international system of unequal pay, where you have a parallel between um, diasporic hegemony and expat hegemony. So in many respects, diasporas or returnees became the repats, right? Replicating this unequal system. And what a lot of domestic Liberians argued is that if you legislate dual citizenship, what you will effectively do is entrench this unequal um, system of, of, of remuneration, right? You will entrench and in many respects institutionalize this unequal system of remuneration. So I'm going to move now to my theoretical contributions in the book. And one of the things that I try to do is to look at Norman Long's notion of actor-oriented analysis. How many people are familiar with this conceptual framework, actor-oriented analysis? I, I see a few hands. Okay, The development scholars in the room will be familiar with this. So Norman Long came up with this idea of actor-oriented analysis. And what I try to do is I employ actor-oriented analysis as my conceptual framework, but I also try to expand it and push it a little bit further. So what Norman Long argues is that in a development ecosystem, you have different actors operating, and they all respond to development interventions. It might be a development project, or it might be a policy prescription like dual citizenship that has development implications. They respond to these different development interventions differently based on their life worlds, and also their social locations, right? But I think the more interesting part of this conceptual framework is he argues that we can't assume that just because an actor is seemingly powerless, right, is seemingly poor, is seemingly marginalized, that that particular actor doesn't have the capacity. In fact, he argues that even the most seemingly marginalized or seemingly powerless actors have the capacity, they have the knowledgeability, they have the capacity to subvert the best laid plans of those who might be seemingly much, much more powerful than them, right? And he says, in this development ecosystem, when this particular development intervention is introduced, there is a process of negotiation, right? So we don't assume that those who are seemingly powerless are ultimately marginalized, right, or sidelined, that there is a process of negotiation taking place. And in this process of negotiation, you can have two things happen. At the interface, there can be a process in which there's divergence, where these different development actors are unable to reconcile each other's differences. They're unable to reconcile each other's lived, uh, different lived experiences or, so or social locations, right? Where there isn't a consensus on the development intervention. Or you can have a process of convergence, right? Convergence where there's an accommodation of each other's differences, where there's an agreement about that particular development intervention. And this certainly played out in my analysis. This certainly played out in the data that I collected because what I discovered and what I ultimately argued is that domestic or diasporic Liberians were fundamentally um, involved in the process of introducing the dual citizenship bill. It was diasporic led. This bill was diasporic led, even though it was taken up by domestic policymakers, right? So they were fundamentally involved in the introduction of the dual citizenship bill. However, it was domestic Liberians who were fundamentally responsible for the suspension of the bill for, the, for all those years. So you see that sort of negotiation taking place where both actors are not able to reconcile each other's differences and you have this sort of um, uh, impasse on dual citizenship for this long period of time. So what I do throughout the book is I try to further the interface analysis. I move beyond localized, bounded encounters over actual development projects where Norman Long focuses on rural areas in the so-called global south. I'm more interested in a transnational ideological exchange. So I think of that as the interface. It's not a physical encounter, it's an ideological encounter and an, an ideological battle over the merits or the demerits of dual citizenship, right? The demerits and the merits of dual citizenship as not only a development intervention, but also a policy prescription that's supposed to have development implications or development um, dividends. Another thing that I do on the citizenship literature front, because I'm also pushing the citizenship literature from the abstract and the Eurocentric to the more concrete and Afrocentric. So I theorize citizenship as a triad, as a triangle. And what I argue 
taking on the work of a number of scholars of post-war reconstruction who've argued that you know, identities, practices, and relations between people actually transform fundamentally in the aftermath of armed conflict, in the aftermath of any sort of political upheaval, in the aftermath of any sort of rupture, right? So obviously an armed conflict would be a part of that, right? And what I argue throughout the book, looking at Liberia historically, is that Liberia's contested state formation in 1847 led to political upheavals of the 1980s and then eventually to all-out armed conflict between 1989 and 2003. And during this process of political upheaval, during this process of rupture, and during the process of the war itself and its aftermath, the ideas of identities, right, the conceptualization of citizenship, the conceptualization of belonging, fundamentally transformed. And what do we have as a result? This Liberian citizenship triad. So in many respects, I asked a lot of my interlocutors, who do you consider to be a Liberian citizen? And they gave me all kinds of responses. It was an open-ended response. And after doing the um, data crunching, I realized that these conceptualizations of Liberian citizenship fall within three different nodes. So one node of the Liberian citizenship triad, which I think can be applied in other contexts, not just Liberia. One of the nodes of the Liberian citizenship triad is citizenship as identity. And this is largely very passive, right? It's you are conferred upon, your citizenship is conferred upon you by virtue of being born in a particular locale or perhaps by having ancestry of a particular locale. And it doesn't really require anything of you. So in many respects, that note of the citizenship triad is about demanding rights, right? Another note of the citizenship triad, which I found to be particularly interesting in terms of the responses of my interlocutors is citizenship as practice, right? This is a more active form of citizenship. It's what you do with that identity that makes you a citizen. In fact, there were so many of my interlocutors who talked about citizenship as contribution, right? It's what you contribute, not only to your fellow citizen, but also to the functionality of the state. That's what makes you a citizen. In fact, one of my, my, one of my interlocutors said in, in sort of flippantly that it doesn't matter what passport you carry, they're all blue nowadays. It's what you do with that passport. It's what you do with that identity that makes you a citizen. Are you contributing to building Liberian capacities? Are you contributing to state capacity by building, by paying taxes, right? Are you abiding by the laws of the state? That's what makes you a citizen. Not that you call yourself a Liberian or you're a particular, um, from a particular ethnic group. That's the identity, more passive form of um, the citizenship triad. And then last but certainly not least, I think of Liberian citizenship based on this data that I collected as a set of relations. So it's about maintaining relationships, cultivating relationships, citizenship as more interactive between citizens, but also between citizens and um, the government or the nation state. So we can think about this triad as identity passive as about claiming rights, practice active as about fulfilling responsibilities, and this interactive node of the citizenship triad as maintaining relationships, rights, responsibilities, and relationships, the so three R's as well. So what I do is I take this conceptualization even further and I think about or theorize citizenship as a political economy of belonging. So that's why I bring a lot of the political economy analysis into the picture. And this political economy of um, belonging is really when socioeconomic transformation effectively depends on the provision of privileges and protections, what we might deem as rights, in exchange for the fulfillment of duties and obligations, what we might think about as responsibilities. So it's this relationship, this symbiotic relationship between rights and responsibilities. And what I was actually quite curious to hear over and over and over again in my interviews was citizenship is about responsibilities as much as it is about rights. And I would argue, and I have argued throughout the book, that this is a post-war kind of conceptualization of citizenship, that it's come out of the experience of the war, that now people start to think of citizenship as more than just the rights part of the equation, as more than just that identity passive form of that um, citizenship triad. And as I mentioned early, my intention in this book is to theorize citizenship from an African or Afrocentric perspective, a post-war African country of immigration, and intending to sort of expand the contours of the citizenship literature, which tends to be very abstract and Eurocentric. So I'm moving it in the more concrete and Afrocentric um, direction. So let's go to my methodological approach and my empirical contributions. So this book is based on multi-sided fieldwork. I alluded to the fact that I interviewed Liberians in five cities, five countries, three continents. It's based on over 200 in-depth interviews, semi-structured interviews with primarily Liberian actors in the capitals of Liberia, 
Sierra Leone, Ghana, the UK, and the US. Um, and the reason I focused on capitals, even though it could be argued that my work is quite urban biased, and I take that fully on as a critique, but the reason I decided to focus on capital cities is because of the work of Sasia Sassen in The Global City, and she argues that citizenship is most viscerally contested in, in urban centers, right, because they happen to be the seats of power. Um, they happen to be the sites where you have, again, that dichotomy between the poor and the prosperous, privileged and non-privileged, powerful and seemingly powerless. And I focus on capital cities because, for instance, Morovia is where you have the, large number, the largest number of Liberians. In Freetown and Sierra Leone, you have a lot of Liberians who fled the war and crossed over um, international borders. In London and D.C. is where you have Liberians who may have come before the war come to study or come to work and ended up staying because they weren't able to go back to Liberia during the armed conflict. And the book presents extensive comparative analysis, analysis amongst the different interlocutors that I spoke to. So I'm very, very interested in the book in analyzing the differences in terms of conceptualizations and practices of Liberian homelanders. So those who may have never left the country um, or they left for very short periods of time and they, own, and they consider Liberia their only home versus those who are more diasporic, right? So the returnees, Liberians, who might be circular returnees, who come in, come out um, periodically, or more permanent returnees who spent considerable amounts of time abroad and now have moved back to the country in the post-war moment. What was interesting to me is the homelanders, um, a small proportion or a small minority, but very vocal minority of homelanders that I interview who were the most viscerally contesting dual citizenship. Those are the Liberians who said, absolutely not, we cannot legislate dual citizenship because it will, again, privilege a seemingly privileged group of already privileged people, right? And it was the returnees who pushed back against that and said, well, we've contributed. You know, We've contributed to agricultural productivity. We've sent remittances. Many of us have come back and volunteered our services as doctors, as nurses. Many of us have come back and worked for the public sector on a voluntary basis. We are already part and parcel of the nation state. Now, what we expect from the state is to extend those rights by granting us citizenship because many of them have now naturalized abroad. I also compare and contrast between executive as well as legislative policymakers, and more importantly, between what Nicholas Van Heer, the scholar at Oxford, calls the near and wider diasporas. So in the case of my study, the near diasporas were those Liberians who lived in Sierra Leone and Ghana, and the wider diasporas would be those Liberians who lived in the UK, here in London, as well as in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. For me, this was really important because I find that the literature, the migration literature particularly, tends to focus on, especially amongst Global South migrants tends to focus on Global South migrants who end up migrating to the so-called Global North. When in reality, the vast majority of Global South migrants are not moving to the so-called Global North. Many of them stay in their regions of origin. So in the case of Liberia, it's Liberians who move to Sierra Leone or Liberians who move to Ghana. The other thing I wanted to push back against um, and fundamentally challenge is this idea that so-called Global South migrants who do move to the so-called Global North are clamoring for the citizenship of the so-called Global North. What I discovered in my research is a number of Liberians who lived in Washington, D.C., right, a large number of my interlocutors, and those who lived in the U.K., many of them never naturalized, even though they were entitled to, Liber to U.K. citizenship or U.S. citizenship, right? For the proportion who did naturalize, a small proportion of those who did naturalize, they naturalized long after they were actually el eligible. There was something about being Liberian, there was something about belonging to this nation state that was embroiled in a conflict that was so important that they, forego, they were able to forego the privileges that come with citizenship, you know, having a UK passport, right? Many of them talked about this fact that I did not naturalize for 10, 15, 20 years even though I was eligible, because being Liberian was more important to me. And the fact that Liberia didn't legislate or didn't recognize dual citizenship, I needed to maintain my Liberian citizenship, right? So not every so-called Global South migrant who migrates to the so-called North is clamoring for Global North citizenships, even though we know that there are citizenship tiers. And geopolitically, there's some passports that wield considerably more power and influence and more accessibility and mobility than those in the so-called Global South. So I was interested in kind of comparing, contrasting all of these different actors within my respondent pool. And you see the breakdown in terms of who I interviewed, where I interviewed them, and um, the numbers, right? Now, I'm very clear about um, the fact in this book that this, this study is, is exp it's 
it's intended to be explored. It's, it's me exploring different trends. I certainly don't make any arguments that my, rep, my sample is representative because it is not. Yeah, so I just want to say that as a, as a caveat. So this table, I'm, I'll wrap up in a few more slides. This table basically is me trying to think about, well, what are the implications of this on policymaking and then also practice as it relates to citizenship and that connection between dual citizenship and development. And this table um, summarizes the kinds of responses that I received when I asked people about whether or not dual citizenship does have development ends, right? So what are the dual citizenship pers perspectives amongst the 202 Liberians that I interviewed? What's interesting is I want to highlight two, 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 um, two parts of the table. The first is looking at support for dual citizenship. Now, I've been speaking throughout this presentation about binaries, about discontinuities, about dichotomies. But in actuality, about 61% of my interlocutors saw dual citizenship as a development good, right? That it could potentially transform the country socioeconomically, politically, if you enable Liberians who've naturalized abroad to maintain their Liberian citizenship in addition to another citizenship, right? So in principle, a lot of my interlocutors saw dual citizenship as a development um, good, that it could potentially transform the country for the better. Now, you contrast this with those who reject dual citizenship outrightly, about 18%. Now, can you tell or someone tell me where the largest number of people who reject dual citizenship reside? Monrovia, right? Monrovia, the largest number of interlocutors I spoke to who reject dual citizenship outright are those who live in Monrovia. And it's very, very much aligned with what I said about home, homelanders being or having heightened levels of anxiety around dual citizenship, whether they be privileged or not privileged, right? Whether they have certain levels of power or maybe seemingly powerless. Now, again, this is not a representative sample, but what I did do was I triangulated what I discovered in this table with Afrobarometer data. An Afrobarometer is a Pan-African survey that's been um, instituted for the past 30 years or so where Afrobarometer recognizes political trends across the, across the continent of Africa. There was an Afrobarometer survey that was conducted in Liberia in both 2012 as well as in 2018. And what's interesting about the Afrobarometer survey is that there was a question on dual citizenship in each of those surveys. And over two thirds of those who were surveyed, now this is more representative, right? This survey is more representative than my respondent pool, but over two thirds of those who were surveyed rejected dual citizenship outright. So in many respects, if you see the trends um, in my representative sample and you compare that or triangulate that with the Afrobarometer survey, it's very, very much aligned, right? Those who reside in Monrovia are the ones who are most viscerally, viscerally um, in contestation or have serious anxieties around dual citizenship if you compare that to the other respondents in other locales. So there was a national referendum in Liberia in 2020. Now this, was, this referendum happened before, right before my book was published. So this referendum took place in December 2020. The book was published in 2021. So the book does not capture the results of the referendum. But it's interesting that a lot of the hypotheses that I have in the book came through in terms of the referendum results. So there's a national referendum in Liberia, and there are eight propositions. The very first proposition is a proposition on legislating dual citizenship. Can you guess what happened in that referendum? Dual citizenship was rejected as a policy prescription, right? It did not garner the two-thirds majority required to legislate dual citizenship. And there were some interesting trends in some counties and some sub-political divisions where you had large numbers of people rejecting dual citizenship. But what I argue throughout the book is that dual citizenship, given Liberia's migratory history, and then more importantly, the trends across the sub-region, right, the trends across the continent of Africa, that dual citizenship would be an eventuality. It it's inevitable for Liberia is what I was arguing throughout the book. And sure enough, a year later, the dual citizenship law is passed, right? So it came to fruition in terms of what I was hypothesizing. 
what I argue throughout the book is that it is inevitable, and this was definitely reflected in even the referendum results where you didn't have two-thirds majority garnered for legislating dual citizenship. Now, I have pulled up results from Montserrado County. Montserrado County is Liberia's largest sub-political division. We have 15 counties, right, 15 sub-political divisions, and Montserrado is the most populous. And what's interesting to me is even though you had an outright rejection of dual citizenship, in many respects, you see the citizenry kind of warming up to the idea of a potential dual citizenship legislation, right? So even though you have Afrobarometer results in 2012 and 2018 saying two-thirds majority reject dual citizenship, the referendum shows something slightly different taking place. So in these results from Montserrado, do you see that there's an even split between yes and no votes? In Montserrado, the largest, most populous county in Liberia, where Monrovia resides, by the way, where the, where the capital city resides, you have 96,356 yes votes for dual citizenship. You have 97,089 votes against dual citizenship. Do you see how that margin is so small between yes and no votes in the most populous sub-political division in Liberia? So what I argue throughout the book is, yes, Liberia is warming up, or Liberians are warming up to the idea of dual citizenship, and this is definitely emblematic of these um, referendum results, even though the two-thirds majority vote did not come, or the two-thirds majority was not garnered to legislate dual citizenship. So yes, dual citizenship is inevitable for Liberia. However, there's always a but, right? So this is um, a bit of a shameless plug that I'm making for a presentation that I made to the Liberian, the plenary of the Liberian Senate in December 2021. So about six months before the dual citizenship law was actually passed. And the president pro temper of the summer um, of the Liberian Senate, uh, Albert Chie, basically called me up and said, I'm hearing rumors that you've written this book on dual citizenship. We have a new law that has just been passed by the House of Representatives. And we in the Senate are a bit more skeptical about legislating dual citizenship. Can you come to Liberia and present the findings as well as the policy recommendations of your book? so that we can deliberate. We can make a decision that's informed, that's based on evidence, that's based on knowledge, and not necessarily just on the sentiments of how we might feel. Now, as a scholar activist, you can imagine how excited I was by this, right? How often do you write a book that has policy relevance where you're actually invited to come back and, and speak to a particular policy issue that might or might not influence the policymaking process? So of course I said absolutely yes. There were a number of things that I told the Senate during the presentation. The first is that yes, even though Liberia is warming up to the prospects of legislating dual citizenship, that Liberia has to take a very gradual, I'll wrap up in a second, a gradual phased approach to this legislation, given that you have, based on my research, such anxieties amongst those in the country about what the legislating of dual citizenship might do in terms of socioeconomic um, inequalities, reproducing socioeconomic inequalities. The other recommendation that I made to the, the Senate at the time was it was important for Liberia to recognize effectively contradictions between the 1986 Constitution, which is more permissive of dual citizenship, seemingly so, and the 1973 Aliens and Nationality Law, which, is explicit, which explicitly prohibits dual citizenship, right? So how do you reconcile those two, those two um, forms of uh, law? Now, the final law, I, I, will, I will say, does reconcile those differences, and I was happy to see that um, in the, the final law that was passed in July 2022. Another recommendation that I made to the Senate is you have to reform the judiciary. How do you ensure that rule of law prevails and not rule of man, right? How do you enforce standing laws? Because one of the things that I kept hearing over and over and over again is amongst diaspora and amongst mostly domestic Liberians, but also some diasporic Liberians is we don't even have dual citizenship and people are passing around with two passports, right? There's de facto dual citizenship where diasporic actors or transnational actors are effectively flouting our laws. So if they're flouting our laws and the law has not le been legislated, imagine when you do pass the law, what kinds of inequalities will be entrenched, what kinds of um, enforcement challenges you might face in, in ensuring that people do abide by the laws of the state. And then the last thing, or next to the last thing that I was interested in having a conversation with the legislators about is how do we address inequalities, inequalities of income, right? inequalities of land access, because that's one of the things that tends to provoke uh, 
forms of anxiety amongst um, diasporic and um, domestic Liberians, and even transnational justice. So you had a lot of Liberians living in um, diasporic hotspots who fueled the armed conflict through their financial resources, right? So how do you bring these people to bear in terms of um, the responsibility of the armed conflict and ensuring that justice does prevail, that they do, um, that there is a form of accountability, that impunity doesn't reign supreme. And then lastly, I talked about the fact that it's important to extend rights to diasporic actors or transnational actors, particularly those who want to maintain transnational lives and carry two passports or multiple passports. But you also have to ensure that you extract responsibility so that you address the anxieties of those who live in the country. And there are a number of ways you can do that. You know, give or grant Liberians the right to vote in national elections or legislative elections. You restrict their rights to be able to hold certain offices, right? So one of the things that made it into the event, eventually made it into the final law of 2022 is that um, all elected offices are limited. So anyone who has two passports or has dual citizenship is not allowed to run for elected office, right? And some appointed positions, specifically those positions that are related to security, that are related to finance, are restricted from people who have dual citizenship, right? So it's one of the recommendations that I um, proffered. Another is definitely grant diasporic dual citizens the right to own land, but perhaps you ensure that those um, that property is taxed. And that property, in terms of taxes, comes back to running state functionality, right? Or perhaps you might even think about introducing income taxes as a form of extracting responsibilities from those who would be dual citizens. So some of these suggestions or recommendations did make it into the final law. And this is what the final law looks like. This is sort of a, a snapshot of the final law. Now, there's a new project that I'm working on called Dual Citizenship 2.0. And the reason I call it 2.0 is because the next phase of the project is to really think about how is now that we've got the legislation on the book, how is it reproducing forms of inequalities? Because remember, that referendum of 2020 didn't go away. Those anxieties didn't go away, right? This notion that if you legislate dual citizenship, you privilege an already privileged group of people those notions and those concerns have not gone away. And in many respects, you can think about the law as being very non-consultative, very elite-driven, didn't necessarily take into account what those people who viscerally rejected dual citizenship in the national referendum of 2020, those particular concerns. Um, it, in many respects, advances the aspirations of diasporic Liberians or transnational Liberians without necessarily reconciling or addressing the domestic anxieties of Liberians. So now I'm interested in how does this sort of play out now that you have a law in the books. Um, last but certainly not least, I want to leave you with a really, really great, um, in many respects, a Cliff's Notes version of the process of contestation around dual citizenship that was written by a Liberian journalist on the right-hand side in Al Jazeera. Um, so if you want a summary, a nice summary of what I've presented, read this particular piece because it does draw on a lot of my research and it references my, my work as well. So I'm going to end there and say thank you. I think I've gone over time, but I look forward to the questions that come. So on, I think, as well. Um, every researcher's dream to, you know, push through a law <laughs> about their research. I mean, it really is quite remarkable. But um, before I open to the audience, I just want to... A few things really, really struck me um, while you were talking. Quite a few things, actually. And, and I think, I think I reflecting now, I think this is why I really wanted to hear you speak, is... Um, the relationship between dual citizenship and, and, and development and uh, all of these really interesting questions. You know, there's, there's this whole um, area of literature on, on aid land, of course. And, you know, when you were talking, I was remembering my own anxieties as someone of dual or perhaps even triple citizenship working in the aid world. Um, and the fact that people would look at me in, in Bangladesh in particular as, a, as somebody who was... Um, privilege, but not necessarily through earned privilege. It was just a kind of borrowed whiteness, if you like, from having been in the UK and having the accent that I have. And 
those sorts of things. And that's, that's something that really struck me. And you see now more and more in, in the aid world that people like us, people like you and me, are you know, at the top of these institutions, you know? Uh, and, you know, I, I noticed somewhere in your work you talk about the World Bank still being a, headed up by white people. It's just not true. It's full of, it's full of, you know, people of color. And it doesn't make it any better. <laughs> it's not making it any better. But it's, it's kind of funny the way dual citizens are seen sort of as both having that power, having the, the, the status in some ways, not, not to the you know the the indigenes of the global north certainly, but seen you know in in the countries that we come back to seems having that power, um, and to the to the you know the 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 the, the global north seen as having kind of um, insider knowledge or insider connections. I mean it is a kind of odd position of power, but it's also the position of kind of seen almost as traitors. I think this comes out very interestingly in in your work. So talk a little bit about that. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just respond to the, the piece where I wrote, and I mentioned the fact that the World Bank, like those IFIs are structured in dominance because, for instance, um, the World Bank is always headed by an American, and it's usually... Well, actually, that's changed because you got Ajay Banda. Yeah, that's a good point. I see what you mean. And the Jim Kim. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. But they still wield power because of their U.S. passports. That's a very, very good point. So that that article that I wrote was written before Ajay Banda became the head of the World Bank and, and even Jim Kim to a certain extent. Um, but that's a good point. So the idea is the U.S. passport, the U.S. citizenship. There was also a lot of contestation around, was it um, Ngozi Awiela before yeah. she moved to the WTO? She was very much someone who was favored to assume the headship of the World Bank, but that never happened because she also had Nigerian citizenship. So it was, so effectively what I'm saying, and then the IMF, for instance, so Antoinette Saye, who used to be the Minister of Finance of Liberia, will never assume the role of the head of the IMF because she, you, exactly, you must be European. And I'm not a fan of these institutions by any stretch of the imagination, but I, what I was trying to argue throughout this particular article is if you have a system that's institutionalized that says you will get a position by virtue of your passport, for me that's fundamentally unequal. And there's something really, really wrong with setting up a system where um, that plays out. And even my own experiences of working with some of these international organizations where they do pay you based on your passport, not on your expertise, not on how much experience you have or whether you might be the most qualified. It's do you have a passport that is not, um, uh, that's, that's an international passport that's not you, unique to that particular institution. So now to get to your question about, sorry, I've forgotten your question now. Well, it's, <laughs> about, it's, it's, not, it's more of a kind of commentary on the, on, on, on the interesting, on, on the interesting nature of, of dual, dual citizenship oh, okay. in relation to, aid and, and aid land and oh, what okay. it's like to be that person. And I think uh, the, the, the discomforts about being seen as a kind of a... Oh, a traitor. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So, so in the book, there is um, a quote that I pull out from an interview that I did with um, Augustin Gafuan, who was the Minister of Finance at the time. And he said, um, you know, one of the things that comes up in public discourse in Liberia is and that why there was so much contestation around legislating dual citizenship is those Liberians who left the country were often seen as those who chickened out because you weren't in the country during the war. You don't have the, in many, in many respects, the credibility um, to claim citizenship because you fled. Um, but then I also talk about another uh, uh, interlocutor who said, you know, quite quite forcefully, I don't have to dodge bullets to claim Liberian citizenship. That is not a marker of being Liberian, right? Because a number of Liberians who perhaps didn't leave during the war would have left if they had the wherewithal. So that should not be the marker of citizenship. That should not be the marker of belonging. That should not be the marker of who, who maintained citizenship because they, you know, they weren't in Liberia during the war. They didn't feel the terrible experience of the war, a lot of Liberians felt the war secondarily, right? So there are different ways of kind of thinking about um, that contribution, citizenship as contribution, or the legitimacy of who can claim citizenship by virtue of having experienced a really terrible ex 
you know, terrible kind of rupture, such as an armed conflict. And that was a, it was a particularly bad one, wasn't it? I'm going to open now to get some questions from the floor. Who would like to who would like to ask a question first? Thank you. And could you tell us your name and what you know, or if, if you're a student or faculty or what you're studying? Hi, thank you for the presentation. I am uh, Kylan. I'm a student from LSE, actually. Um, and my question is um, around the stereotype that dual citizenship is often of a developing country and it's sort of a combination of a developing country plus a non-developing country. Like, is that is that sort of representative of the majority of people who do want to seek dual citizenship? Because I have heard of instances of my own country um, being China, um, people wanting to seek Cambodian or Thai citizenship because of their ancestry or heritage, uh, but it was uh, sort of restricted. And that, well, according to my friend who did, does face this kind of uh, barrier, um, claims that most of the people who does want to seek dual citizenship is wanting to connect to their heritage instead of seeking privilege. So how would you respond to that? Thank yeah, you. It's, a, it's a really, really good question. Um, and I talked about it in the form of, you know, the sort of neoliberal economic entitlement, so forth and so on. Um, well, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of Liberians wanted to <laughs> reclaim their Liberian citizenship, because that idea of belonging to Liberia was very, very, very important to them, which is why they held on to their Liberian citizenship for so long, even though they were eligible to naturalize in the UK or naturalize in the US. Um, another group of people, not just Liberians born in Liberia, for instance, who wanted that, who wanted to claim the rights of citizenship, it's also those who were not born in Liberia. I interviewed a number of second generation Liberians who were born in the UK, who were born in the US. And for them, it was very, very important to have that sense of connection with the country. And one of the ways of um, operationalizing that was for them to be able to carry the passport. Uh, so yes, you know, citizenship is not just a sort of instrumental tool or commodity that, that we use to gain privilege, whether it be economic privilege or political privilege or mobility privilege. It can also be about that sense of belonging. And that's why I termed the subtitle of the book The Political Economy of Belonging, because it's very, very much about the economy and the political dynamics of that, but it's also about this notion of belonging. And that's something that you can't necessarily quantify. Um, so you're absolutely right. It's, it's more than, than just the kind of instrumentalizing of citizenship. Um, it's about what does that mean for connecting to a place, whether that's an idea, a place as an idea, or a place that's more concrete in your mind. Does that, does that answer you? That's a good question. I, I, yeah, I, I, I wonder about those things myself. There's another thing that struck me, though, very much is that the, you know, you, your term, the diaspocracy which I think is, is a really good one. Um, you know, what, what we're doing here, I think, in this post-war setting is, is seeing, um, you know, an, an effort to construct or reconstruct an elite. Is that right? Would you say that was right? Yes, absolutely. And I think, I mean, beyond just studying it and, and interviewing people and then trying to come up with some sort of conceptual framework that makes sense within the context of Liberia, um, is also experiencing it for myself. So I saw firsthand how the diasporacy manifested itself in terms of interactions between those who returned and those who probably never left, or if they did leave, they left for very, very short, period, short periods of time. And I saw a lot of Liberians come back with a sense of entitlement, with a spirit of hubris and not humility. <laughs> you know, There's that alliteration again with the spirit of contempt and not collaboration. And that fueled the tension, that fueled the animosity, that fueled the resentment, in as much as they were paid significantly more. It was, how do you treat your fellow Liberian when you come into a context in which you've been away for a very long time? Do you recognize that they also have something to contribute? That their values, that their um, skills, that their talents should also be recognized and validated and used um, in as much as those who may have left um, and for me, this diasporacy was this very, very, very much about um, constructing a, a, another hierarchy of elitism. And so I kind of, I even hark back to what happened in the 1800s and the 1900s of these Liberians moving, or not even Liberians, but these black migrant settlers moving back 
And I said that there is a parallel here where you do construct hierarchies of belonging, where you do construct hierarchies of who's valued, who's privileged, replicating itself in the kind of 21st century moment and how we have to be very, very careful about that history. Um, how we also have to be very, very careful of, about not replicating that history because it's one that created the tensions that eventually led to the armed conflict of 1989 to 2003. But moving back itself is a really interesting term because of course we don't know where those Americans came from, right? Yeah, I mean, some Liberians will trace their ancestry back to, in fact, there's a population of um, Bayesian, so those from Barbados who came from the Caribbean, about 346 Bayesians um, traveled to Liberia in 1865 and settled in Liberia. And I think two presidents can trace their lineage to that 1865 migration of Bayesians from Barbados to Liberia. In fact, Right now, the Barbados government and the Liberian government are having something called the, the Year of Return, where those descendants of those original Bayesians who came, the 365 Bayesians who came in 1865, are now going back to Barbados to reconnect with their family members. Um, so it's, it's very, very interesting because, because of this nature of the migratory history, the nation that is a migratory, um, a migratory nation. Yeah, fa fascinating, absolutely unique unique country. I suppose Sierra Leone is somewhat similar. Yeah. So any more questions from the floor? Yes, please. People online will want to hear your questions too. And please don't forget to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Danielle, master's student at SOAS. Um, I was really curious about this dynamic between um, like homeland Liberians and the diaspora returnees, particularly with your discussion on how I guess it seems like there's kind of a bit of a contrast where the diaspora and returning Liberians have this sense that their contributions to the country should be recognized through citizenship, but in contrast, you have the homeland like anxieties about their privilege. So I'm really just wanting to understand, do the homeland Liberians see that those like returning and diaspora contributions just aren't enough to justify their um, like the citizen the recognition of their citizenship and like what's kind of driving that because if to your points about like diasporacy as well like they are in some ways like involved in government uh, sending remittances there are a lot of ways that they are trying to contribute to the country um, but why aren't those contributions enough for homelanders to want them to have citizenship as well and like how do they perceive those contributions to the country's development? Yeah, it's it's a good question. So it's it's interesting because going back to that table where I said you know sixty one percent of my interlocutors actually think dual citizenship is a development good, right? It will contribute to socioeconomic, political kind of con um, transformation. But there was a very strong and forceful <laughs> minority of those homelanders who said, absolutely not, this is not going to work. And I think one of the things that came up in my analysis and in the interviews amongst homeland Liberians, those who were the most viscerally um, you know, anti-dual citizenship, is that they use the example of remittances, whereas diasporic Liberians and transnational Liberians and even some domestic Liberians talked about remittances as um, evidence of why dual citizenship should be extended to those who live abroad. These interlocutors argued that those remittances go to households. Those remittances are not used for broad-based national level development, right? Um, and in many respects, if there's no trickle down, you know, it might. It might deal with transient poverty at the household level, but we're not talking about this sort of formal kind of transformation of the nation. Um, and so what they argued is that you can't use remittances as sufficient evidence to talk about why you should be granted dual citizenship because you're not contributing to the nation, right? This idea of contribution. You're contributing to your household, the household, the extent of kind of extended household in Liberia. Um, and in many respects, those who migrate, I mean, the migration literature is replete with this uh, evidence. Those who migrate are not the poorest of the poor. They're usually the most privileged. And then the remittances then also reproduce forms of inequality between households because households that aren't getting remittances don't have the wherewithal to send their children to school or to pay for exorbitant healthcare costs when they're not receiving uh, monetary transfers from abroad. So they actually push back against that. But what's interesting is I did speak to a Liberian in Washington, D.C., and he argued, okay, if that's the argument, then we'll stop sending remittances and we'll see how families fare, right? So, I mean, I, I got so many interesting responses from people in which I would be in an interview and I would say, but I heard this in one of my interviews, or what do you think about this? And sort of playing angel's advocate to get people to think about things slightly differently. 
beyond their own kind of immediate needs. Because what I found is that a lot of my interlocutors thought in silos. So in many respects, it's how is this going to affect me? Not necessarily what does this mean for national level kind of socioeconomic structural transformation. Um, so I saw arguments on all different fronts in terms of um, you know, contributions versus non-contributions. Another example that was brought forward is yes, these returnees or importees are contributing to public sector productivity, but a lot of them steal. You know, they steal. So that's why I showed that dichotomy between the corrupt forms of cultural profiteering versus the public sector productivity. And you saw both happening simultaneously in the same development ecosystem. So it's almost like people will say, well, that, that cancels the public sector productivity because they've stolen so much money and there's no accountability, right? That, that really is quite depressing, that bit of the story, I have to say. Well, which master's program are you on? International finance and development. Oh, okay, great. Any other questions or comments from the floor? Yes. Back there, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Helena. I'm also at SOAS. I'm a PhD student in development studies. Uh, this was super interesting. I need to get your book. Because um, one of the things I'm researching is how... Ethiopian and Eritrean migrants to the UK uh, understand the concept of belonging. Oh. Um, and so I'm looking at this idea of citizenship as well and how you know, this group looks at that because um, they're two of the seven countries that don't offer dual citizenship. And you know why. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting because a lot of the people that I've spoken to so far, um, it seems to be the opposite kind of reaction. It's a very administrative thing for them. They say that you know, it's just who I am on paper. It doesn't right. affect my belonging. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could... If from people you've spoken to, um, there were any other concepts of belonging? So not just this kind of like top-down mm -hmm. institution tells me I belong because of my citizenship, but rather I belong in Liberia because of X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah. It, it, for me, that's, that's why I was able to, that's why I was very, very intentional about constructing that triad, where I said the sort of administrative belonging would be that identity kind of passive note of the of the citizenship triad but then when you start going into the active practice based citizenship oh thank you <laughs> when you start going into the active practice based citizenship that idea of contribution regardless of whether or not you have the legal status as a citizen the fact that you contribute that imbues you with a sense of belonging and and more than just you thinking that you belong it also enables people to think of you as belonging because of that contribution um, so I really like this idea of citizenship as contribution, not necessarily, not necessarily just citizenship as holding the passport or having the legal um, claims to citizenship, because it can, look, it can look differently depending on the context, right? Um, a lot of Liberians that I spoke to abroad even said, even after I naturalized, the fact that I would go to Liberia every year to render health services as a medical doctor, I still felt a sense of belonging, even though I wielded a UK passport. The fact of the, li the, fact of the matter is nobody can take that Liberian nest from me, right? There was one interlocutor uh, policymaker who came up with, and I talk about this in the, in the empirical, one of the empirical chapters about what does it mean to be a Liberian in the post-war context, and he says, a Liberian is someone who, pr who provides time, talent, and treasure and if you're familiar with the Bible, it's a biblical reference where it says where, your time, where, where you place your time, your talent, and your treasure is where your heart is. And that's how he conceptualized citizenship. He said, I don't care. He's the one who said flippantly, I don't care what kind of passport you wield around. They're all blue nowadays. What I care about is are you contributing your time to Liberia? Are you contributing your talent to Liberia? Are you contributing your treasure to Liberia? That's what makes you a citizen. So that idea of contribution came out through his own conceptualization of time, talent, and treasure. And I was surprised and I was pleasantly surprised that so many interlocutors I spoke to thought of citizenship in these ways, um, beyond the legal, beyond the administrative, beyond the identity, beyond the passive. They were really, really wedded to this idea of citizenship as practice and active-based citizenship. And I think this really comes out of the war, that our configuration or conceptualization of citizenship changed as a result of this political rupture, this moment of political rupture. Yeah, it's really interesting as well because um, in Ethiopia, I think it was 2012, they introduced the Ethiopian origin card, which gave you basically almost all of the same rights and responsibilities in the country except voting rights. Yeah. So when that happened, I'm looking at the data that with that as well, 
it seems like a lot of people took that as motivation to then naturalize wherever they were because it now gave them access to doing everything they wanted to do back home except voting rights. Yeah. So I was wondering as well, did any, was there any discussions in Liberia about that kind of like middle ground? Yeah, yeah so it's one thing that I proposed before they passed the law is if uh, two thirds majority of the Senate rejects this bill that had been passed by the House already, what you think about is this gradual approach, right? So, and I did give them examples of um, even the, the Indian card, there's a card, I forget, O-I. N-R-I, what does it stand for? N what does it stand for? O-C-I. O-C-I, that's it. Oh, so I, Oceania. Yeah, so I gave them examples from India, I gave examples from Ethiopia, from Eritrea, where you have this sort of middle ground or um, happy medium until you eventually legislate dual citizenship, where people have some rights, but it stops short when it comes to political rights, because that's where people start to get very anxious about, can this person vote if they have two passports? Can they become president if they have two passports? Then can they become the minister of national defense if they have two passports? You know, that's, this idea of divided loyalties becomes very, 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 very challenging and concerning for a lot of people. But they eventually passed the law six months later, so I guess that wasn't really, that happy medium wasn't really, you know what, I will say something, and I didn't say this during the presentation, and that's why I, I kind of emphasize this idea of the law being very elite driven, because the anxieties that the legislators had were really about challenges from transnational actors in terms of running for political office. So once that was no longer in the equation, they were okay with passing the law without even thinking about, well, what other anxieties exist beyond the political realm socioeconomic anxieties that exist beyond the political realm because they barred dual citizens from running for any sort of elected office. So as far as they're concerned, their political fiefdoms were secured. So it's, like, it's okay, always about elite struggles at the end of the day, isn't it? What'd you it's say? It's always about yeah. elite struggles. Yeah. You, you scratch the surface of these, Absolutely. Of these contest agents. And I also discovered that my presentation was about legitimizing. <laughs> I realized later, I was like, oh, when they passed the law, they didn't insert a lot of my recommendations about addressing these domestic anxieties. It was like, oh, the scholar from the LSE says you should bar dual citizens from running for elected office. Fan, fine, now we can pass the law. So I realized, wait, I got bamboozled <laughs> like doing this presentation because they were able to then legitimize through scholarly research that the barring of dual citizens from um, holding elected office is actually just legitimate. <laughs> for your next impact statement, well, for your I next know, research grant I application. Know. But there's, there's another thing that I was thinking about. Um, I have multiple passports, and uh, I, the ones that I do have don't necessarily connect to my sense of belonging very much. Um, but uh, what happens when people are mixed race? So, you know, you, you've gone off, you've gone to England or the US or Ghana, and you've, you've got another kid. I mean, this, you know, this is also to do with the, the, the race-based citizenship, right? I think of my nieces and nephews who are a quarter Sierra Leonean and a quarter various other things, and you know some of them don't look very African at all. Uh, how will they get their Sierra Leonean citizenship? What, what happens to the, 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 the people like us who don't really fit into the neat boxes? Yeah, it's a really, really good question, and it's definitely delved into the new project. So I was able to conduct archival research and then also semi-structured research. I'm going back to Liberia and Sierra Leone to do focus group discussions with members of parliament in Sierra Leone and then members of the national legislature to see if there's an appetite for legislative reforms as it relates to these race-based clauses. But in addition to interviewing these people, I also discovered in Liberia that there's a small population of mixed race Liberians who will never have access to the citizenship and have never held a Liberian passport because the law is very clear that if your father, for Sorry. instance, <laughs> is of non-Negro descent, then automatically um, your entitlements to Liberian citizenship are questioned. And even though a dual citizenship law was passed that effectively would now administratively grant these people dual citizenship or grant these people the ability to hold Liberian citizenship, that's different in terms of the practice or the enforcement. So I interviewed about 20, 25 mixed race Liberians who have Lebanese and or Indian, um, Lebanese or Indian fathers um, who've told me that they, when they go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, even though they can prove they have a Liberian mother or a black African mother, black Liberian mother, um, they're given a hard time. And there's actually a law that says you have to pledge 
an oath of allegiance. Even though you were born in Liberia, you have mixed race. You have to pledge an oath of allegiance to the nation state in front of the Temple of Justice. And then you have to pay $1,200 um, to gain a Liberian passport. And many of the mixed race Liberians that I spoke to have no connection whatsoever to their Lebanese father or their Indian father. Uh, many of them are quite poor. So think about it. Would they actually be able to afford that $1,200 so to claim the citizenship? Charge. Yeah, very much so. They can't, they can't vote. Um, having a national ID. I mean, it, it has all kinds of implications for the ability to travel. So I'm focusing, one of, the, one of the chapters of the book is I'm focusing on these mixed race Liberians and mixed race Sierra Leoneans to a certain extent to ask questions about, um, well, what does it mean to be a Negro in the 21st century? That idea of Negrohood. Um, you know, what does it mean? How does it actually manifest itself in practice in terms of policy making, but also the experience of living in this body um, in a country that effectively states that you don't belong, even though you were born there. That's, that's really powerful stuff. Sorry, there's a question from the, yeah? Do you, will you read it out to us? Thank you. Questions from the online. Yeah, we have a question from Tanya Kaiser from the Development Studies. She's saying, thank you so much for your presentation. Absolutely fantastic and wonderful to have you back at SOAS. I was interested to hear about, it was very interesting to hear about this distinction in experience and perspective between people in the near and far diaspora. Is there anything specific or particular about the perspective of those who spend many years in Ghana, given the GOG's uh, subsequent policy responses for former refugees in terms of residency rights and local integrations? It's a really, really good question, Tanya. In fact, it's funny. I think I, I need to embed this in the, com in the presentation more because people are always curious about the near versus the far and how um, their conceptualizations of citizenship and practice of citizenship might differ. And I do talk about that throughout the book. So one of the things I discovered, um, especially amongst Liberians who eventually moved and settled in Ghana and or Sierra Leone, many of them were refugees. Now, that's not to say the vast majority of my interlocutors were, were refugees, but a good number of them were. There were some who might be deemed more ec so-called economic migrants who didn't come to Ghana or Sierra Leone as refugees, but many of them did. And because of the refugee status kind of protocol, you, as a refugee, you cannot naturalize, <laughs> right? If you want to maintain refugee status, you can't naturalize. In fact, it's, it's prohibited in terms of the, the, refugee, um, the refugee protocol. So just by virtue of being refugees, the Ghanaian government and the Sierra Leonean government didn't enable these Liberians to naturalize. And in order for them to continue to re receive privileges from the UN um, High Commissioner for Refugees, they couldn't naturalize. What I discovered is that I think, and I propose or I hypothesize that it's because of that that they were more wedded, like strongly wedded to the idea of singular nationality. And if I compare that to the more, or the wider diasporas, many of whom left Liberia before the war and ended up naturalizing 10, 15, 20 years after being eligible to, who were less stringent about this sort of singular citizenship as a marker of legitimacy, as a marker of belonging, as a marker of um, having more credibility. So it was, it, it was that experience of refugeehood. It was that experience of refugee-ness where ideas of, of Liberia as a, sing, as a singular kind of citizenship became more entrenched during protracted, refugee, uh, during protracted refugee experiences in a refugee camp in Ghana or in a refugee camp in Sierra Leone. In fact, there was one uh, refugee who spent some time in a former refugee because the status of refugees for Liberians was um, discontinued in 2012 because at that point UNHCR said, now Liberia is stable, you can move back to your country, you either get repatriation or resettlement, um, but you have to make a choice, right? So one of the former refugees that I spoke to at the Buruburam refugee camp in Ghana argued that this idea of double nationality is one that was quite anathema to him. He said, you can't have two passports, you know, you can't serve two masters. That kept coming up over and over again, kind of harkening back to kind of slave imagery. Um, you either choose one or you relinquish it. Uh, and I found that that kind of rhetoric kept coming up over and over again amongst the refugees that I, or the former refugees that I interviewed in Sierra Leone and in Ghana. Whereas I didn't hear that kind of rhetoric in the wider diasporas because many of them were eligible 
they weren't refugees, they were eligible to naturalize, they chose, they make a very a, a clear kind of concerted decision not to naturalize. So I think the ability to naturalize opens up all kinds of, of differences of how you might conceptualize citizenship versus the inability to naturalize. So the question that I had is, you know, if these refugees in Sierra Leone or Ghana had moved to the US, would they have had different understandings or conceptualizations of citizenship if the eligibility were part of the equation? I mean, I don't know, but I did see those stark differences between the near and the wider. So thank you for the question, Tanya. Any others? This will be your last chance. No? Well, we look forward to welcoming you back with the new book when it comes out. When are you thinking that's going to be done? <laughs> or where, what stage are you at? Are you in the research stage? Everybody always asks that question. <laughs> uh, it's like the old PhD question. Do you remember that question? Yes, I remember. <laughs> when are you going to finish? <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm still at the data collection phase, but it's a project. I will say that it's a project that I've been wanting to work on for a long time. And I'm just taking my time and just, um, and just you know, having fun with it. So I will, I am very committed to coming back and presenting uh, that body of work, but I'm just not sure when. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. My Jeff. pleasure. Really, really thank enjoyed you it. for the invitation, Naomi. <laughs>